every alleged hate crime, no matter who the intended target, is an affront to who we are and who we always have been, both as a country and as a people. That was Attorney General Eric Holder on Thursday speaking at the memorial service for the victims of the Sunday shooting at the Jewish community centers in suburban Kansas City. And I just want to point out that the alleged shooter, Frazier Glenn Cross, has also been known to go by the name Frazier Glenn Miller, which is what we've been, been calling him here, just in case folks were at all confused behind that. All right, so, so I, want to, I want to ask a little bit about um, sort of this point that the Attorney General is making there um, and that we've been trying to make around sort of who counts as someone we should be afraid of. And, and and the report, um, your, your own report, showing that the traffic to stormfront.org surged after the election of President Obama, that there are more than a quarter million registered users and nine million posts there. Um, what should I make of the fact that there was a surge after President Obama? Because I, I don't like the idea that President Obama is the initiation of this, and therefore, if he went away, so too would this kind of angst go away. I think President Obama is seen in many quarters as the culmination of it. Mm -hmm. You know, since the year 2000, we've seen about a 50% increase in the number of hate groups in our country, and that's being driven by the changing demographics of the nation. So Obama gets elected, and people say, look, there's visual proof that the nefarious Jew has stolen the country kind of on behalf of people of color. Right. And, you know, so that's what Obama symbolizes. When, when he was elected, uh, Stormfront got five times its normal traffic, and it said, you know, we are the white answer for white people. The day after he was inaugurated, a white supremacist who was just uh, addicted to the net named Keith Luke killed people in Brockton, Massachusetts. So, you know, Obama didn't drive those numbers. He was the culmination of it. All right. So there is a part of me, right, and this is part of what I, I'm, I'm struggling with. So there's a part of me that says, okay, when you see that, when you see a group where we know that there has been killings that have emerged from it, and you see these conversations happening online, and you know that there's a bit of a trigger here with the representation among, uh, of an African-American president, get in there, get some surveillance, come on, American state. <laughs> but then, right, I say, but wait a minute, how do we then not repeat the thing that is what we did to Muslim communities post 9-11? I think there's a, there's a reflex to feel under these kinds of circumstances that there's something additional or new or different that has to be done. And, I, and just to resist the premise a little bit, I haven't seen a case effectively made that sound, sophisticated policing and intelligence isn't up to the task of the challenges we face. Uh, you know, the, the solution isn't to prejudge an, another group. At a minimum, the point of departure should be our Constitution, which requires some level of criminal suspicion and rejects the use of race or ethnicity or religion as a proxy for criminality. Mm -hmm. um, and then other than that, I think a sober-minded assessment of where the threats actually come from, that's the discussion we're having. Mm -hmm. But for sure, throwing policing resources at surveilling uh, a grade school for Muslim girls, as happened in our case, can't possibly be the answer. It, it doesn't make it any safer and does lasting harm to these communities. I, I really like that phrase, the, re the rejection of race as a proxy for criminality, which I think we could talk about that in so many contexts. I want to play two things for you. I want to play Harry Reid talking about Mr. Bundy and the language that he uses, and then Mr. Bundy's response to Harry Reid, and, 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 and then just get, get your response. Let's listen to both of those. There were hundreds, hundreds of people from around the country that came there. Uh, they had sniper rifles on the freeway. They had assault weapons. They had automatic weapons. Well, these people who hold themselves out to be patriots are not. They're nothing more than domestic terrorists. When you hear Senator Harry Reid call you a domestic terrorist, what do you have to say to the senator? <laughs> Well, I guess he's right. I don't know what else would be. We're definitely uh, citizens riled up. I don't know whether you could call us terrorists. There's most loving people here I ever spent in my life. I just can't see how he gets that type of description out of these people. Your responses to hearing Mr. Bundy say, well, I guess, I'm, I, I guess I'll be that domestic terrorist for you. These are loving people. It's funny that he would even say that he'd take that because the way that the media uh, portrays um, people like Miller and others, like they have a double standard about who they call terrorism, what you call domestic terrorism. We can have many cases, John Starks putting his airplane into an IRS building. I mean, when do we call these people Aurora Shooter? When you look at, you know, the uh, Sandy Hook, like it takes a lot for us to call someone who's a white man a, a domestic terrorist. But the minute it's someone who has a name Mohammed, it's very simple. It's very easy to, to, to label that. 
And I'm, well, I mean, I mean in the, so, so let me just say, in, in fairness, so so with, with Mr. Miller, there, there is an act of violence and murder. In, in the context of Mr. Bundy, there is not, in part because of the choices the government made, I think, to stand down, there was no acts of violence at the, yet, right? We, yeah. that, that, I mean, that, like, that has not yet occurred, and, and hopefully, in fact, never will. That said, like, even the, the sort of willingness to take the language, I still wonder if there's like a, so some groups, it ends up being the ascriptive category, that whole group is a problem, versus saying, okay, this may be troubling in this individual, but we don't presume this to be true of an entire group of individuals. I mean, that's the case in the, in the Muslim community. You know, you had 19 hijackers, and because of 19 people who are part of a 1.7 billion people faith, and that we all are subject to targeting and, you know, uh, other being otherized, you know, in our country. I'm a born and raised Brooklynite. Right, exactly. I'm a public school. Like, like where are you from? Well, sure. Brooklyn. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't get more American than this right yes. here. And being otherized based on a few people in my community, or maybe not, I don't consider them even a part of my faith, but yep. um, for the purpose of the conversation, Muslims that, that did something really terrible, and we got the brunt of that. Yep. And, and, and the other, you know, issue that I have and what my fear is also is that, you know, we're fighting this, like, existential threat, like, Al-Qaeda, like, when is that going to be over? It's yep. not like when we were, you know, in a war, World mm -hmm. War One, World War Two, where that war was going to end one one day. Yep. We don't even know when this war against, you know, American Muslims or Muslims worldwide is going to end. We just don't have that. And, and I'm worried that my kids who grew up in nine, post 9/11 America. Yep. When is this going to be over for them? When are they going to be proud of who they are and, and be able to say, I'm a proud Muslim and not have to feel like their American identity and Muslim identity don't actually coincide? Uh, the great double consciousness of Du Bois. Thank you to <laughs> Linda Sarsour and Oma, Omar Farrar. Dorian and Richard are sticking around. Stay right there. We're going to dig into an alarming new report from the Southern Poverty Law Center on the link between a racist website and deadly hate crimes when we come back.